today we will be looking at the chapter wave optics from a cbc point of view and uh, specifically academic year 22 23 in 16th century there was a debate between um, sir isaac newton and uh, christian huygens there was regarding what is the nature of light what is light is it a particle it's a wave is it a ray is it something else now that debate actually extended even after their death for about 300 years and it was due to the combined efforts of james clark maxwell uh, albert einstein and a lot of dignitaries in science that we now look at light as having a dual nature sometimes it behaves like a particle sometimes it behaves like a wave now there are uh, phenomenons exhibited li by light which could only be explained if we consider light to be a wave and there are certain phenomena like photoelectric effect which could only be explained if we treat light as a particle <clears throat> so in this chapter we will be uh, looking at light as a wave which is a model put forward by Christian Huygens. Now, in the previous chapter, ray optics, we were very happy with treating light to be a ray traveling in a straight line. But that theory was insufficient or is insufficient to explain phenomena like interference and diffraction. We will see those phenomena later in this chapter. So without any further ado, we are going to start our chapter. So all of you know that light is an electromagnetic wave. An electromagnetic wave is produced by time varying, time varying electric field and magnetic field uh, acted perpendicular to each other. So as a result of which a disturbance or energy is propagated in a mutually perpendicular direction. We call it as electromagnetic wave. Light is an electromagnetic wave. Now, <clears throat> The Huygens theory or wave, nature, wave theory of light begins with the idea of wavefront. Uh, the idea of wavefront is actually beautiful and creative. So it suggests something like this. If you have a source of light, uh, it could be of any shape. Uh, it could be like a, a tiny spherical light source or a, a linear light source like a tube or something like that. You take a light source <clears throat> you um, record or like, uh, you make a collection of all the points after a given time. So you look at all the light rays starting from a particular point or a source and after some time where they have reached and you are taking a collection of that. And that is what you call as a wavefront. So a wavelet is a point of disturbance due to propagation of light. And a wavefront is the locus or collection of all points, all these wavelets having the same phase of oscillation. So if they travel the same distance or if their path difference is the same, naturally its phase difference is going to be same or we are taking all the points that vibrates with the same phase. We call that as a wavefront. If you draw a perpendicular to this, what we are going to get is ray, which we saw in the last chapter. So there are different shapes for these wavefronts. First is a spherical wavefront. As you can imagine, it is produced by a, a, a point source. That is, uh, it has a sim spherical symmetry. When you look at a linear source <clears throat> and you um, make a collection of all the points um, after a given time, they will be, uh, it will be like uh, drawing a cylinder. And uh, the light has reached these points on this curved surface. You have something called a plane wavefront. Imagine if your light source is at infinity, it is coming from a large distance. Then if we look at all the points vibrating with the same phase, oscillating with the same phase, and we make a collection of this that will look like a plane. Now, 
the amazing theory or um, concept put forward by Huygens related to this is the concept of or principle of secondary wavelets. The idea is pretty simple. If you take a wavefront, let's say a spherical wavefront, what he suggested is every single one of those points can be source of a secondary wavefront. Meaning, each one of these points are capable of producing a secondary wave of its own. So whenever somebody put forward a, a, a whole new theory, then they are, uh, you know, it is their duty or responsibility to explain all that is existing. For instance, let's say the obvious thing, we will start from the obvious things like a reflection and refraction. And our, it was ray optics was good enough to explain um, <clears throat> a reflection and a refraction. So the question is, if we take light as a wave or uh, adopt all these concepts, then will we be able to explain uh, the phenomenon reflection and the refraction? We will see that. And this is a very important proof from CBC point of view. Reason being, this year syllabus has been cut short tremendously from the chapter wave optics. It was one of the biggest chapters in a grade 12 and <clears throat> it lost the Doppler effect, um, then uh, polarization and um, derivation of interference and uh, ideas of diffraction. So um, this is what is remaining, uh, which is a guaranteed question. So now we will look at um, the phenomenon of reflection, explanation of the phenomenon, reflection and refraction, considering um, light to be a, a wave. <clears throat> First, we will look at the phenomenon reflection. Reflection. So we have to consider a mirror, of course, a plane mirror. Now we are going to consider <clears throat> a plane wavefront. Okay, so there is a plane wavefront, and there is one ray as part of this plane wavefront. We have another one. Okay. And uh, we will draw a normal at this point. We can call this point as A. And this is angle of incidence. Now, this is 90 degree. This is also 90 degree. So this will be 90 minus I, which in turn proves that this is going to be I. Now imagine this wave is traveling with a speed V in this medium. This medium could be air, water, whatever. So in, let's say, a given time tau, this ray reaches or travels V into tau distance, V into tau distance, okay? <clears throat> now, in the same time, a secondary wave originating from A is going to travel the same distance V tau, okay? Now, let us look at it like this. Now, what we are going to do is we take this in compass and we are going to draw an arc that has the same radius V to and we are going to get something like this. Okay, the radius of this arc is V to itself. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to, from this point, we call this like a B. Now we are going to draw a tangent to this arc from the point B, okay? We'll see how that turns out. It is going to look like this, okay? And I'm going to uh, connect these points A and this. Now you can see two triangles. One that looks like, you know, this. And uh, another triangle that looks like this. Pardon my crude drawing. That 
should look like it is um, congruent to each other. And that is exactly what we are going to prove. <clears throat> so again, similarly, if you, here, um, if you draw a normal, okay, you can mark this as R and 90 minus R. So leading this to become R itself. We are going to look at these two triangles. Let us call this like A prime and this like B prime because it's an extension of A and B. So you have a triangle <clears throat> A, A prime, B, and um, B, B prime, A. Now clearly you can see that this angle and this angle is 90 degree, of course. Okay. Angle A prime and angle B prime, they are equal to 90 degree. For both the triangles, um, this side is common. And specifically, that is the right angle. Sorry, um, hypotenuse. Uh, the side that is opposed to the right angle. <clears throat> and uh, you know that this distance is going to be V1, V into tau. And this is also going to be V into tau. Okay, so now the triangles are congruent and all the angles corresponding to the uh, same sides are going to be equal also. So we have proved that angle I is equal to angle R. And this is nothing but law of reflection. Hence, we can prove the law of reflection by treating um, light to be a wave. <coughs> The next idea is to uh, prove the law of refraction um, for by treating light to be a wave. To study refraction, refraction, you need two mediums. <clears throat> Let's say medium one and medium two. We will again consider a plane wave front. So we have two little rays at this end. Now in this medium one, uh, the light is traveling with the velocity V1. In medium two, light is traveling with the velocity V2. Just like what we did in uh, the proof of law of reflection, we will again draw normal, mark this as I and this as I itself. And uh, in a time tau, this wave travels uh, a distance V1 into tau. So this distance is V1 into tau. Now, in the same time, <clears throat> this a uh, wave enters the second medium and there obviously it will suffer refraction. So if the second medium is denser, not necessarily, we can prove it either way. Uh, in that case, this wave will bend closer to the normal and uh, go like this. Okay. Now we will take the same time tau and now the velocity is V2. So what we are going to do is find the distance traveled by this ray or wave front in that same time. And uh, that distance is going to be V2 into tau. So what we will do is we are going to take an arc and uh, of radius V2 tau and draw it like this. Now from here, <clears throat> we are going to make uh, a tangent to this wave front. Okay, so something like this. Now, this angle is R, this angle is 90 minus R, this angle is 90 because this is radius and a tangent. So, this angle is going to be R itself. Now, <clears throat> let's say you call this point like A, B, whatever you want. When you take sine I from this triangle, this triangle, Okay, sine i is going to be opposite side divided by um, hypotenuse. 
so v1 to divided by ab similarly sin r you may write like v2 to divided by ab itself when you take sin i by sin r <coughs> you are going to get v1 to divided by ab divided by v2 to divided by ab ab and ab gets cancelled tau and tau gets cancelled you are going to get v1 divided by v2 now v1 is the velocity with which light travels in medium 1 v2 is the velocity with which light travels in medium 2 that is not going to change so v1 by v2 is going to be a constant and you know what that constant is it is the refractive index of the second medium with respect to the first medium and this is nothing but Snell's law Snell's law this is the second law of refraction hence we can prove that or we have just proved that the law of refraction can be proved if uh, we treat light as a wave. So those are the existing phenomena that we had to, of course, uh, explain in terms of wave nature of light. <clears throat> when you guys were kids, all of us have played with making water waves, right? Dropping something in a pond or a lake or a pool and uh, be amazed at the waves that is formed in water. So imagine like you had a friend and uh, both of you drop, let's say, two stones simultaneously into the water. Waves will be produced at two different points, of course. Now, what will happen to those waves where they collide with each other or um, exist together? In grade 11, in the chapter waves, you have learned about the superposition of waves. <clears throat> Their uh, amplitudes will get added up. So if crust of a wave superimposes with crust of a wave, it will get nullified. Or the effective amplitude is going to be zero, provided they have equal amplitudes. We are going to look at a simulation to understand the phenomena interference. Now, from this topic, Young's double slit experiments equation, derivation, equation, equation for fringe width is actually deleted. So we'll be looking at it qualitatively. <clears throat> so interference. Uh, you see what is happening here. They have two different taps. Both of it are dropping drops of water here, producing waves like this. Here, <clears throat> you can adjust various things like their separation or amplitude, and you can observe the changes. So these two waves are superimposing with each other, and uh, whatever is the resultant is what we will observe at any given point of time. Now, <clears throat> we are going to do the same experiment with light now, okay? So this is a light generator and uh, you have two slits here. According to Huygens principle, every point on the wavefront will act as a source of secondary wavefront. So when this wavefront reaches this slit, you can see that it produces uh, a new wavefront of its own. Now they will superpose with each other and you can see on the screen that they are going to produce uh, alternate dark and bright fringes like this. You can change the color of the wave and see what is going to happen. You can even change amplitude also and see what is going to happen. Now, other parameters that we can vary is the width of the slit. So I'm going to make it as narrow as possible. I can even control the slit separation, okay? So you can see what is happening here. Slit separation as I increases, you can see it like this, okay? Slit width also I can change and I can observe various pattern here on the screen. 
if I decreases the wavelength even further, sorry, increase the wavelength further, I'm going to get something like this. Now you can actually see alternate bright and dark fringes here formed on a screen. Move to red and uh, see what is going to happen. <clears throat> Again, alternate dark and bright fringes uh, produced here. Okay. So uh, a dark region plus a bright region together is called uh, a fringe. And uh, the expression for fringe width, uh, the derivation of expression for fringe width is uh, deleted from the syllabus. You can see interference um, in real life also. Like let's say <clears throat> some water is, um, there is a water puddle or something. And uh, on it some drops of petrol or diesel or oil is spread, creating a tiny little layer. And you have seen a brilliant little colors formed in that. It is due to interference. The same thing. Even relatable example, you can see the same thing in a soap bubble also. That is also another example for interference. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, Young's double slit experiment and expression for fringe width. We will uh, the experiment that you have seen here is uh, what you call as Young's double slit experiment. In Young's double slit experiment, you have two slits here, hence the term double slit. And Yang is the name of scientist. And uh, if you uh, take a wave here, and uh, uh, you can actually change th this distance also, okay? This distance also. We had that uh, derivation. You will understand what is the significance of the slit width and uh, the distance between the slit and the screen, the wavelength and everything. So for the time being, just understand this. And this is called a Young's double slit experiment. And your syllabus specifically say no derivation is required, but the final uh, expression is required. So we will look at the final expression. <clears throat> Since the final expression is there, uh, you will have you can expect numerical questions from there also. Okay. So this is Young's double slit experiment, and um, the position of bright fringe and dark fringe could be found out by using this. Um, see, you get the equation of fringe width, okay? Um, by measuring the distance between two successive dark fringe or bright fringe. And both the expression is going to be the same. And that expression is going to be D lambda by D, where capital D is the distance between souls sorry, not source, the slit to the screen. And small d is going to be the distance of the slit, um, separation of slits. <clears throat> and uh, as you may recall, the fringe width also changes depending upon the color. In the uh, simulation that I have shown you, you might have observed that also. So the width of the fringe also depends upon the wavelength of the light itself. So that equation is important for numerical questions. <clears throat> now, that is one of the most repeated questions. Mm, if we take two independent bulbs, you know, in this experiment, Young's double slit experiment, you know that two slits acted as source of um, two waves, which in turn, superposed to produce interference. <clears throat> now, why do we use um, two slits? Can't we use two identical bulbs? Okay. Uh, everything, the making and everything is going to be same. And uh, so it should produce same kind of light. So can two independent light sources produce interference? Now, the answer is no, it cannot. The condition for producing interference is that the two light sources has to be coherent. Coherence means <clears throat> uh, the light produced by these two sources, it should have same amplitude, um, same frequency, all these things, of course. And more importantly, most importantly, it should produce light 
at constant the phase difference always otherwise what is going to happen is that if at some point crust and a trough interfere or something like uh, two crust interfere if phase difference is not maintained throughout the pattern will continuously change okay so in order to obtain sustained interference or continuous interference the two sources has to be coherent and the basic condition is that it should always produce a light of constant phase difference what is wrong with again using two independent light sources if they are identical <clears throat> the reason being a light source um, produces light by means of excitation and the excitation of electrons that is something that you cannot control you cannot say an electron to jump now and de-excite and form light and uh, even though the time delay taken for that is really small uh, you are not going to get um, constant phase difference uh, light from two independent light sources. So it is not possible. <clears throat> now, the last and final phenomenon of this chapter is diffraction. Now, let's say I'm in my room and uh, somebody plays music from the other room. Um, let's say my um, door is opened. Even if I am um, sitting uh, close to the wall, hmm? meaning there is no way like a uh, sound wave will come directly to my ears and hit my ears, I'll still be able to hear the music. <clears throat> the reason being, the light is bent around, not light, sound is bent around the corners. So let's say this is a room, okay. This is my room and I'm sitting here. This is me and uh, there is my door. And uh, some music is played from here. So waves are coming. So if we consider these waves to be traveling in a straight line, <clears throat> we'll never be able to explain this phenomenon. So what is going to happen is that as per Huygens theory, uh, this slit or separation or door act as source of secondary waves. So these waves will reach my right here. Now the question is whether we can expect the same from light also. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Meaning you have a light source. Again, this is my room and this is where I am sitting. And uh, there is a door here. So light is supposed to go like this and it is supposed to create a shadow region. I'm not supposed to see anything here. This is called a geometric shadow region and that can be obtained by treating light to be traveling in a straight line. But what is going to happen is that light will bend around these corners a little bit than it is expected. So this encroachment of light of light into geometric shadow region is what you call as diffraction. Diffraction. The diffraction is uh, exhibited by all the waves actually, not just light. Mm -hmm. Now, in sound, there is more diffraction. In light, there is less. So what could be the reason for this? Or what is the parameter that decides how much light is going to bend or encroach? The parameters parameter that explain the same is the wavelength of the light and um <clears throat> the width of the slit the width of the slit so if they are comparable to each other okay then if they are comparable to each other then we can see diffraction prominently okay so if you want to observe um diffraction um, of light then the slit will or should have the same or comparable wavelength as that of light itself, okay? And you know that light, visible light, if you consider, has a wavelength range of 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer. <clears throat> so your width also should have a comparable uh, separation, okay? In that case, diffraction will be uh, observed.
so the next phenomenon is diffraction and uh, <clears throat> imagine you have a slit and you are uh, irradiating the slit with uh, a light source and this is how you are going to get uh, in the center you have a, a really bright fringe then a dark region then a bright region but this bright region is less brighter compared to the central one the center one is what we call a central maxima or principal maxima then first to secondary minimum uh, first to secondary maxima like that it goes now the major difference between interference and diffraction is that in diffraction pattern the intensity of these fringes they are different in interference on the other hand if you remember even though you know it forms like alternate bright and dark fringes all these fringes has the same intensity okay um and we are going to look at it mathematically now the width of central maxima is again deleted from the syllabus <clears throat> so you have a slit like this and uh, it is about to pass through a convex lens a converging lens so these waves will converge at uh, this point central point if you consider a point here or a ray that is coming through this end and this end they are going to travel equal distance to reach here so they will have the same phase difference same path difference which in turn produces a constructive interference or maximum brightness condition and the so central fringe will be uh, brighter now you consider any arbitrary point <clears throat> let's say that point is dark okay let's say that point is p1 now this ray is making some angle theta1 while it reaches from here to here now here from here to here the path difference because obviously the ray from b has to travel more let's say this is like lambda so that from the center it is going to be lambda by 2 it obeys a condition like this then it will form a dark uh, band for the next dark band to happen you divide this into four different so that <clears throat> the path difference, let's say, total is like 2 lambda, because lambda already reaches up till P1 only. So 2 lambda. Okay. So each of this will be like lambda by 2, lambda, 3 lambda by 2, 2 lambda, like this, forming a dark fringe here. You can construct the same over and over again for different order. The one in the center, <clears throat> we call it a central maxima. This is the central brightest fringe. This is the first minima. This is the second minima. First minima, second minima. It will happen on either side. It will be symmetrical as you saw in the figure. Uh, so here it will be much brighter than here. As you can see, when you go on either side, the intensity reduces. Equation also you just uh, remember because again derivation is not required. The equation is that d sine theta is equal to n lambda. n is the order whether it is the first minima or second minima like that. And theta is the angle made and d is the width of the slit. So with that this chapter is over. I have uploaded all these materials in uh, the team's channel. <laughs> But you have to look at the syllabus and uh, <clears throat> see which all topics are deleted. I have already shared uh, the uh, deleted portions list also. So when you prepare for exam, be wise and uh, look at only whatever you need. Thank you so much.